Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Simon and I should be talking to you about uh, epistemic health, self-trust and bipolar disorder. The motivation behind this work is an overarching interest in the relationship between epistemic agency and mental health. Now, broadly by epistemic agency, I'm thinking in terms of our status as potential owners of and distributors of knowledge and our potential to have intellectual interests and projects and to pursue those interests and projects. And I'm interested in our status as epistemic agents understood in this way and mental health and more specifically a two sided relationship where one, we can think about the ways in which mental health contributes to or impedes us in our capacity to act as and to be epistemic agents in the way described. And two, we can think about the ways in which our exercise of epistemic agency, as well as factors that enable or impede that, contribute or not to mental health. To coin a phrase, what I'm interested in is the concept and nature of epistemic health. Now, determining just what it is to be mentally healthy, and similarly, what it is to properly realize one's epistemic agency is no easy task. Likewise, cashing out the concept of epistemic health in any more detail than this is a longer term project. What seems easier, however, and this is to grossly oversimplify, is to pick out particular mental disorders or negative mental health conditions, even whilst questions about what mental health and mental disorder are from a philosophical perspective remain open. In similar light, then, I propose that a good starting point to think about the concept of epistemic health is to think about situations in which mental health and epistemic agency are both compromised and in a way there is a link between those two compromised states. Or as we might put it, we might start by thinking about epistemic health disorders. The purpose of this talk, then, is something of a proof of concept. It's an attempt to pick out one area where I think there are tight connections between mental health and epistemic agency, more specifically by focusing on the relationship between epistemic self-trust and bipolar disorder. And through doing so, I hope to illustrate the idea of an epistemic health disorder. So firstly, I'll introduce the model of self-trust that I'm employing. Secondly, I'll look at some of the key features of bipolar disorder. And finally, I'll look at the relationship between self-trust and bipolar disorder. Firstly, let's look at self-trust. To start, it's going to be useful to introduce a little bit more jargon to refer to a simple idea. This is the idea of an epistemic project. So roughly, the thought is that for most any project plan or activity that we engage in in life, there will be some part of that project that will require the exercise of one's epistemic and cognitive faculties. So say, for instance, that I'm appearing on a TV quiz show such as Jeopardy or University Challenge that quizzes my general knowledge. There could be all kinds of reasons for my doing so, and it will involve all kinds of different actions and activities. But a crucial part of this plan is that I must acquire a significant body of general knowledge and be able to implement it. This last is an epistemic project in the way I am thinking of it. Moving on, what are we talking about when we talk about self-trust? Well, we can think about this in terms of a stance that one has to take towards oneself, one's cognitive faculties, intellectual abilities, and one's reliance upon them if one is to carry out one's epistemic projects in an epistemic normatively adequate way. So for instance, in a way whereby one can acquire knowledge by engaging in those projects. What kind of stance is this? Well, I follow here probably the predominant view in the literature that self-trust involves an effective or emotional stance towards oneself one's faculties, abilities, and one's reliance upon them. So, first of all, employing the idea of an epistemic project, this idea that self-trust involves a stance towards our reliance upon ourself in intellectual and cognitive ways. Uh, let's define effective self-trust in terms of one's relying upon oneself when one carries out one's epistemic projects, and one's doing so out of, to borrow a term from Karen Jones, an attitude of optimism about that dependence. 
The second thing I want to suggest about effective self-trust that is important is that it explains why we carry out our epistemic projects in the way that we do. More specifically, uh, because I trust myself is under the right circumstances, a good answer to the question, why do you think you carried out or are carrying out such and such an epistemic project well? Questions about the nature of self-trust then are questions about optimism. And what we want to know is how effective self-trust qua optimism offers an explanation of the kind described. Um, so, and working that out is going to help us to catch out the concept of optimism uh, a little more. So on the model I'm employing, there are three aspects to this. So the first two of these aspects relate to the psychological nature and cognitive functional role of optimism as an effective attitude. And here Jones describes this in more general terms. Uh, rather than read out the slide, I give you an opportunity to pause the slide and read through uh, Jones, the quote from Jones. Okay, moving on. Firstly then, optimism as an effective attitude has this cognitive functional role. Second, as an effective experience, self-trust qua optimism is motivational in the way that effective experiences are more generally. So here we already have a partial answer to how I trust myself is an answer to questions about how one conducted one's epistemic projects. One, because it's part of the nature of self-trust that it controls and influences what we pay attention to, what we consider salient, or otherwise put, which epistemic moves we see as good. Two, because it's part of the nature of self-trust that it motivates particular epistemic strategies, i.e. those that we see as good. Now, both of these are broadly speaking psychological explanations, but if self-trust is to offer an answer to questions about how one conducted one's epistemic projects, then it must also have some rational content i.e. such that we can, at least some of the time, say that self-trust is a good answer to those questions. I suggest that we can understand this in terms of a series of stacked presumptions underwriting the nature of optimism in the context of self-trust. As labelled, these are a presumption that one's projects are worth pursuing, a presumption that one, one could accrue the relevant benefits if competent, and a presumption that one is competent in the relevant ways. Now, importantly, these presumptions do not have to be believed, but to act inconsistently with them is to fail to manifest the kind of optimism associated with self-trust. These presumptions then provide the rational structure of optimism and so self-trust, thus rounding out the idea that because I trust myself offers a full explanation for why one conducts one's epistemic projects in the way one does, i.e. because it's in the nature of self-trust to pay attention to only certain possible moves, to be motivated to follow them and to do so in a way that is consistent with the presumptions listed. Thus, it offers a psychological explanation of why one conducts one's practices as one does, and if one is permitted to act under the presumptions listed, it provides a rational explanation too. Before moving on, it's worth briefly considering or comparing self-trust to its opposite, self-distrust. Now, just as self-trust can be understood in terms of a disposition to rely plus optimism, Self-distrust can be understood in terms of a disposition not to reply plus pessimism. Self-trust is like self-distrust self is like self-trust in the sense that it influences what one sees as salient and has a motivational, or perhaps better put, a demotivational competent component. The distinction is that these lead to a lack of action or a failure to rely in ways that it can consistent with the two presumptions listed here, presumption of incompetence and a presumption of worthlessness. So that's self-trust. Let's move on to discuss the key features of bipolar disorder. So uh, the bipolar disorders are described in the DSM as uh, episodic mood disorders 
defined by the occurrence of manic, mixed or hypermanic episodes or symptoms uh, alternating with depressive episodes or symptoms. Uh, there are three principal varieties of bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder one, in which the patient uh, has at least one manic or mixed episode. Bipolar or disorder two, in which the person has at least one hypermanic episode and one depressive episode. And cyclothymic disorder, uh, which involves a persistent mood instability with symptoms of hypomania or depression. So given these definitions, the core clinical features of the three disorders are those symptoms that are characteristic of manic, hypermanic, or depressive episodes. So let's have a look at these first. So for an episode of depression, the person must have five of this set of symptoms, including one and two, for at least two weeks. And here I've picked out four that are most directly relevant to this discussion. So depressed mood, markedly diminished interest or pleasure in all or almost all activities most of the day, feelings of worthlessness or excessive of excessive or inappropriate guilt, and diminished ability to think or concentrate or indecisiveness. So here are the uh, key symptoms of uh, mania and hyper hypermania. So uh, episodes of mania and hypermania must involve an elevated or irrit irritable mood plus three or four of the following symptoms. Three if the mood is elevated, four if the mood is irritable. Uh, with mania, these symptoms must persist over seven days and may lead to hospitalization. With hypermania, the symptoms have to persist only for four days or more uh, and by definition will not lead to hospitalization. Uh, just to note, a mixed episode uh, involves uh, mania plus three symptoms of depression or vice versa. So again, I've picked out four of the symptoms of mania strike hy hypermania that are most relevant to the current discussion. Uh, these are inflated self-esteem or grandiosity, being more talkative than usual or uh, feeling the pressure to keep talking, a flight of ideas or the subjective experience that one's thoughts are racing, and an increase in goal-directed activity, socially, at work, at school, or sexually. Okay, so that's the basics of bipolar disorder and all we need for the current discussion. Uh, in the last part of the talk, I want to illustrate what I think is interesting about a relationship between self-trust and bipolar disorder. Uh, to elucidate this relationship, I want to introduce and discuss a few short passages from the bipolar memoir, An Unquiet Mind by Kay Jamison, in which she describes various episodes of depression and mania or hypermania. So first of all, I want to share two passages in which Jamison describes separate episodes of depression. Uh, again, rather than reading these out, I shall leave a moment for you to pause and read through the pieces yourself. Okay, so the first thing to note is that in both of these passages, Jamison is describing uh, her intellectual activities, and I think in a way that fits with our talk of epistemic project. Second, the two passages clearly describe Jamison's experiencing of the symptoms of depression. So depressed mood, diminished interest, feelings of worthlessness, and a diminished ability to think or concentrate. Third, and this is key, I want to suggest that the same experiences that are symptoms of depressions here are also symptoms of a def deficit in self-trust. So overall, in both passages, Jamison, Jamison's activities are ground to a halt, representing a general failure of reliance on herself and her epistemic faculties. More specifically, she fails to see options of how she might carry out her intellectual projects. Instead, she's reduced to staring out the window, shuffling her books around, and so on. She experiences a lack of motivation. Her mind laughs at her plans rather than cheering them on. And she's quite explicit about uh, experiencing feelings of worthlessness in regard to her plans. Finally, in all of this, 
and in her capacity, incapacity of concentrated thought, she acts as if she lacks the kind of competence that is needed for her intellectual projects. In the same episode, then, we might say there are symptoms of both depression and a deficit in self-trust, i.e. excess self-distrust. What is important to note, though, is that the symptoms of distrust are not caused by the symptoms of depression. Rather, it's the same experience, features of which are constitutive of a depressive episode that is also constitutive of her distrust. Okay, moving on. In this next passage, Jamison describes the onset of an episode of hypermania and later mania. And again, I should let you read the passage on your own. So here's a chance to pause the video. Okay, so note once again that Jamison here is describing that something that can be called an epistemic project. Second, just as the previous passages clearly describe the experiences of depression, so Jamison clearly describes in this passage her experience of symptoms of mania, or at least hypermania leading to a, a further episode of mania. So there's elevated mood, inflated self-esteem and feelings of grandiosity, a flight of ideas, an increase in goal-directed activity. So third, and similarly to the previous passages, I want to say that Jamison is at the same time describing experiences that are characteristic, or we might say symptomatic, of having an excess in self-trust. Uh, and particularly it's an excess given that she's not a humanities scholar. So first of all, in stark contrast to the previous passages, Jamison not only relies on her epistemic fa faculties, but she does so to an extreme, following every turn of her mind as if every turn of her mind is good. And uh, yeah, she clearly sees epistemic strategies and follows up on them. So see her frenzied selection of books as sources of information that she doesn't doubt are good choices, uh, her mind weaving according to a certain rapturous logic, and so on. She not only sees her project, whatever it quite is, as worthwhile, but admits that its ambitions are grand, a view of the whole universe, no less. And finally, all through, the passage describes someone who is carried away with the sense of their own competence, with no doubt that her selection of evidence is good, though retrospectively she realises it was not, and certain that her mind's weaving flight of ideas will lead her to the absolute truth. The relationship between the experience and symptoms of Jamison's manic or hypermanic episode and the experience and symptoms of her excess self-trust then parallel the close relationship between depression and distrust in the previous passages. And again, this relationship is not one in which the symptoms of mania cause an excess in self-trust. Rather, it's the same experience, features of which are constitutive of a manic episode that is also constitutive of her excess self-trust. So what's the significance of this reading of the two passages? Well, what I've hoped to illustrate is how there is a significant and tight relationship between epistemic self-trust and mental health. One in which symptoms of a mental disorder, as per the case study, can not only coexist with excesses or deficits of self-trust, but that the very same experiences and symptoms that constitute, constitute an episode of depression or mania can at the same time also constitute an excess or deficit in self-trust. What I suggest to finish then is that this kind of distortion of self-trust in the case of mental disorder is an instance of what we might call an epistemic health disorder, where, as a first pass, these can be defined and categorized as follows, and where, on the distinction given, distorted self-trust via mental disorder were classed as a first-order epistemic health disorder. Okay, that's the end, so thank you very much.